Kevin, you frequently join us for discussions on the ongoing war on whistleblowers and journalists. One of the whistleblowers you've recently written about, uh, who Sammy mentioned, is Terry Albury. Could you explain for the viewers at home who is Albury and what does his story tell us about the war on terror at home? Terry Albury is a whistleblower who was convicted under the Espionage Act. He's a former special FBI agent uh, and a black man who uh, who has a lot of experience with the sort of programs that we're all committed to ending. And, and he, he took a lot of courage, but as profiled by Janet Rettman in New York Times Magazine in the first part of this month, uh, we, we get a lot of details and information about what was going through Terry's mind. And uh, it's unfortunate that someone with his conscience went to prison um, and was sentenced to four years in prison. Uh, but I think, you know, when you compare agencies, uh, often these are treated as like rival agencies, but when you go between the, the FBI and CIA, I think there's a tendency to look at what the CIA did and the fact that they were implicated in a brutal and heinous torture program is how we view them. And that's how we should view them. But then what happens is people think that the FBI has done everything by the book, that it's been pretty much a, uh, a kind of a, a civil agency when it comes to handling terrorism over the last 20 years. It's just simply not the case because in fact, when you started uh, in the first months after the September 11th attacks, what Attorney General John Ashcroft had uh, the Bureau doing was rounding up people on suspicion of immigration violations and hiding um, up to 1,200 people indefinitely in uh, detention and then ultimately deporting them, um, deporting a huge majority of those people on um, immigration violations so they weren't allowed to stay in the country. And so Terry comes up through the, the ranks of the FBI. He's out in Berkeley. Um, he's part of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Eventually he ends up in relocating uh, to Minneapolis and he's part of the field office there. And he, he witnesses a lot of racism among the agents, you know, and particularly because there's a Somali community out there and they target those people um, pretty extensively. And they even use slurs like skinny to describe the people around them pretty, pretty um, flippantly um, with, with no consideration at all for, for what that means. Um, and you, you find in his uh, profile some very compelling and, and uh, um, I, I, I guess heavy admissions about the role that he played. He says, I helped destroy people for 17 years. And I think that that something that uh, played a, a big role in him deciding to give documents to the intercept. Although he actually didn't give documents, he took um, screenshots of the documents and sent those um, photographs over to the intercept um, in order to do their stories. Uh, but um, uh, he, he writes, uh, he, he told Jan, and I, I put this down just to make sure I read this before, when we talked about Terry, was, he said, there's this mythology surrounding the war on terrorism and the FBI that has given agents the power to ruin the lives of completely innocent people based solely on what part of the world they came from or what religion they practiced or the color of their skin. Um, and then he also said what the FBI was directing us to do was go into these communities and instill fear and then generate this paranoia within these people so that they know that they're under suspicion perpetually. Um, and so he describes, you know, the sort of things he was able to do and allowed to do as an FBI agent. He could sit across from a mother and he could pressure those people and he could say, you know, if you don't give me information, um, we might not give you the green card that you want. Um, you could dangle like immigration visas. You can dangle these things before people and abuse these authorities in order to get them to comply with you. Um, not only was it looking for information, but there's uh, stuff that he revealed about the coercion of informants. And then I think importantly, the other thing that we see develop and, and really take hold under President Barack Obama's administration is that whole idea of countering violent extremism and having these things that he call, that are called shared responsibility committees. And essentially the idea was that you could get people in a community who were respectable leaders, the, the ones that are like teachers, let's say imams, um, religious people, 
um, and, and the such, and and having um, I don't know, maybe police officers, etc., put them together on a committee and have them uh, be involved in intervening if you see a young person who you think is going to go down the path um, towards violence. I mean, it's a very in a way, it's like religious profiling for juvenile delinquency. I mean, we have problems with that in this country, but it's just saying specifically that you're going to target um, Arab, Muslim, and South Asian people and say that they're susceptible, more susceptible to violence. So it's already got a bad basis in that respect. But then the idea was, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on this point, the idea was that um, the, the FBI would let this com community intervene before they got swept up in an investigation. And what Terry points out is that, you know, all this information could be packed, passed back to the FBI. Um, it could be used to form the basis of a criminal investigation. That committee has no idea if the criminal investigation is moving forward, even though they're trying to do something useful for uh, a young person um, to make sure that their life isn't destroyed, that they can still have a future. And, um, you know, they can also choose to, if they would like, hold this, the, this committee liable later on if that person were to commit an act of violence. So in effect, failing to stop this person from going down the route of uh, terrorism, however that might be defined by the U.S. government, could be something that blows back in the faces of this committee. Uh, so you're almost left wondering, why would you even be part of this partnership with the FBI? But that's the kind of toxicity that Terry challenged. And unfortunately for taking on the FBI, he ended up being sentenced to prison under the Espionage Act. Yeah, and at the Shared Responsibility uh, Committees were an example of something called Countering Violent Extremism, which was a framework that was rolled out, I believe, under Obama as the sort of softer, gentler approach to counterterrorism. But they very heavily uh, rely on what Marjorie was talking about with preventative or predictive policing. The goal is that, or the, the theory is that you can intervene before someone becomes a terrorist and there are set paths to how one becomes a terrorist. Um, I'm sorry, violent extremist, how one becomes a violent extremist. Um, and, you know, this has been deployed against the Muslim community in an incredibly racist and Islamophobic way. And the trend since then has been to expand it to to other groups, right? You, the, you, we, my colleague Sue went to a CVE presentation in Washington, D.C. from the U.S. Attorney's Office where they had stuff in there about black identity extremists. Um, and they had this bizarre game for middle schoolers that the FBI made, a computer game for middle schoolers to teach them to identify which of their peers in middle school would be terrorists. And the initial version of the game was... Uh, extremely racist, extremely criticized for that. So they went back and put into it, you know, like animal rights activist and, and Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican nationalist like that. And all of this is rested on this theory called radicalization theory, where the FBI basically is saying, you know, there is a set path to becoming a radical. It's when you adopt ideas the FBI don't, don't like, then you go and become a violent extremist. And we're going to intervene before you get to the violent extremist phase, which means intervening based on politically protected speech. And we absolutely saw the Trump administration rolling this out in their task force in response to the George Floyd uprising. And we see a lot of discussions about these types of philosophies in sort of the new framework of going against sort of quote unquote domestic terrorism, where they're taking the discredited and debunked uh, strategies of the international war on terror and sort of the ones who are applied to Muslim communities and applying them to anarchists, to Black Lives Matter, to militias, uh, et cetera. I, I just want to ask you one follow-up question. You mentioned that Terry Albury was uh, imprisoned under the Espionage Act. How does this compare to other people who have exposed abuses of the war on terror? Well, I would say that it's hugely severe. And, you know, he's not the only person we could go down a, a list of people and, and name them for challenging the, the war on terror framework, or at least key aspects of it. Uh, Thomas Drake um, challenging the, the idea that you know, a system that sh is set up to do 
surveillance to prevent terrorism at minimum should have constitutional safeguards in place and that the NSA shouldn't be steamrolling over the privacy rights of Americans. Um, you know, that doesn't even get to whether entire populations around the world should have their communication swept up. But at least um, there's the fact of the Fourth Amendment in the United States and uh, the NSA is supposed to uphold the Constitution. And yet they went after him and were trying to put him in prison for 40 to 50 years under the Espionage Act. Um, there's John Kiriakou challenging the CIA torture program. Um, we've seen people who challenge the drone program, um, uh, an assassin, a targeted assassination complex that has sprouted uh, declaring that you, know, you can launch uh, these strikes anywhere in the world as long as you declare it a part of the battlefield. And Daniel Hale is serving a 45 month sentence right now uh, because he uh, blew the whistle and revealed documents to The Intercept about the drone program. Um, we've seen various aspects of the war on terror framework exposed through documents provided to WikiLeaks by Chelsea Manning. Um, and we've seen the kinds of responses to that. And then I'd add Terry Albury into this group as one of um, the few people who actually came forward and, and said something. But, you know, I will say um, there, there, there's this there's this quote that um, that really strikes me um, from uh, Dennis Kucinich, who was a representative back in 2006. Um, he was in the Congress. Um, one of the few people who, when you look back at the months after 9-11, who, who had some prescient comments about what could happen as, as we went down this path. Um, and he said, and he was speaking about an FBI whistleblower named Colleen Rowley. Who, um, who had some really important things to share about what the FBI knew before the 9-11 attacks, but they didn't act upon it. And what he said was this, model employees are either ignored or told to keep their mouths shut. Their honesty is not rewarded, but rather they and others in law enforcement, national security, and the intelligence community are punished through a systematic and harsh series of personal and professional retaliations. There's absolutely nothing subtle about the retaliation which whistleblowers face. Scare tactics are used to enforce discipline, to warn other potential whistleblowers against coming forward. National security whistleblowers are subject to harassment, to transfers or demotion or unrelated personal attacks about their sexual activities or personal finances. Instead of examining merits of allegations, the story becomes shifted to the whistleblower's conduct. And uh, you know, there's a number of examples we can go through in the last 20 years. I won't now, so I can let other people speak. But you know, essentially, we have been at a loss for national security whistleblowers, I think, because of the policy of making example out of people who do dare to speak. And, um, and, and there have been a few that have defied that policy. But I think there's, there's probably dozens upon dozens of people within these intelligence agencies who were wanting to speak out but haven't in the last 20 years because of a policy that was um, embraced by the Bush administration. And you can include Dick Cheney and other officials along with Obama and, and his, his administration. And then the, and the Trump administration ramping this up to you know well over 100 miles an hour when you look at how they were prosecuting people who wanted to blow the whistle at, uh, and doing investigations into leaks at even like three to four times the rate of the Obama administration. 